Bachelor of Computer. She completed a Bachelor of Computer Science specialization in biomedical computing at Queen's University. Her main focus is applying weekly supervised learning to predict ductal carcinoma in situ recurrence in patients. Her previous research included creating segmentation algorithms for CT and MRI, rapid 3D printing, prototyping of medical devices, and 3D model development for facial orthotics and transtibial leg prosthetics at the University of Toronto. So Phoenix, go ahead, share your slides. All right, it help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Phoenix Wilkie, and I'm in, sec in my second year working towards my PhD under Dr. Anne Martel's supervision. So today I'm going to be presenting a side project from my thesis. Now, digital pathology uh, involves the digitization of tr traditional pathology slides to create high resolution images that can be viewed and analyzed on a computer screen. In the late 1960s, Cambridge Instruments launched the first automated image analysis system, which really marked the first significant steps towards computer-assisted pathology. By the 1970s, the first picture archiving and communication system, or PACS, allowed for digital storage and the retrieval of medical images. Now, over the next two decades, lots of work was done to develop digital imaging systems for pathology, and these advancements have led to our modern ability to take high resolution scans of histology slides. Within the past decade, an unprecedented amount of work has been done to apply machine learning techniques in digital pathology. The 2014 Chameleon Grand Challenge especially stimulated this research and development. Then COVID hit. And suddenly everyone was locked in at home and it became more important than ever to be able to collaboratively work from anywhere in the world. Digital pathology really facilitated that. So now we have an abundance of public and private data sets to use. Many machine learning challenges also promote collaboration in the community to develop algorithms that solve different computational pathology tasks. And here are just a few examples. So these data sets have all been published and can be used in research. With all the data that is currently available, it is more important than ever to be able to curate high quality data sets to avoid downstream task problems and optimize machine learning algorithms. Now, here's a crash course in digital pathology slide preparation. So firstly, the tissue is collected, fixed, and then embedded into paraffin wax, and then it's cut into very thin sections, typically three to five microns thick. These tissue sections are then stained and mounted onto glass slides. During staining, various dyes, such as hematoxylin and iosine, or H&E, are used to highlight different tissue structures and cells. H&E is the most common dye combination, and the hematoxylin is a basic-like dye which stains acid molecules blue, like the nucleic acids, and eosine is an acidic dye which stains basic molecules pink, like the cytoplasm. So the majority of the images throughout this presentation are going to be H and E. However, there are other stains that will be very present as well. So quality control is performed on prepared slides to ensure that they're of high quality and suitable for diagnosis. They're turned into whole slide images using specialized digital pathology scanners that capture high resolution digital images of the tissue samples. Then these scanned images are processed by specialized software that corrects for image distortion, adjusts contrast and brightness, and removes background noise. The resulting image files that are saved from these scanned tissue slides are referred to as whole slide images. And as you can see from the image on the slide, uh, they're arranged in a pyramidal shape. This is called map tiling, and it allows for less computational resources when a user would like to zoom into the image, as only the tiles that need to be viewed will be loaded. For an example that might be easier to visualize, think of Google Maps. Uh, it works the exact same way when you zoom in using satellite view. So these whole slide images are stored in secure databases, and they can be accessed by authorized personnel from anywhere in the world. The size of these whole slide images can have implications for storage and data management though, as well as the processing and analysis, because these are huge images. In terms of physical dimensions, a whole slide image can vary depending on its scanning resolution and the original size of the tissue sample. So most machining learning uh, models are currently fed small patches that are cropped from these whole slide images as their inputs. So to visualize this better, 
uh, a 40 times magnification scan of a one by one centimeter tissue sample will actually result in approximately 40,000 by 40,000 pixels, which translates into a physical size of 3.3 by 3.3 centimeters. But not all scanning is perfect. Uh, technical issues with the scanner, such as mechanical problems, image distortion, or focus problems can cause artifacts in digital pathology images. Additionally, compression of the digital image can lead to a loss of detail and the introduction of artifacts. So some very common causes of out of focus regions in particular are contaminants, dirty glass, dust, pen markings, air bubbles, fingerprints, tissue thickness irregularity, and tissue folds. To circle back on this abundance of whole site images that now exist, it is super important that we remove the whole site images with artifacts to create high quality data sets from the get go and avoid the whole garbage in garbage out scenario when we're training our models. So for quick diagnosis cases, many out of focus regions are ignored if they're not diagnostically relevant. However, this is not acceptable in many machine learning applications where every extracted patch needs to be of high quality. Therefore, a pathologist must manually annotate the slides and look for these out-of-focus regions. And this comprehensive out-of-focus annotation has been documented to take between 8 to 16 hours per slide to verify focus quality. So therefore, uh, we hypothesize that we could create a very user-friendly out-of-focus detection model that would automatically find focus quality problems and be simple to use for anyone without coding experience. So hopefully this example comes across clearly on your screens. Uh, this is a slide with varying levels of out of focus from mild to severe. Annotating these out of focus regions is very easy when you're looking for extreme out of focus. However, in many cases, it's a more mild out of focus and you can only see it when you zoom into the whole slide image. So here's another example of how out of focus actually affects downstream tasks in machine learning applications. So HoverNet is a deep learning architecture for image segmentation tasks, particularly in digital pathology. It was introduced in 2018 at the University of Warwick and has been shown to achieve state-of-the-art performance on several challenging medical imaging segmentation tasks, including cell segmentation in histology images. So the HoverNet architecture is a very popular baseline model for many image segmentation applications. And in the above image, you can see that there is an original clear patch followed by artificially blurred patches that mimic real out of focus. And then these same images are overlaid uh, next to them with the output from the HeverNet cell segmentation task. And clearly the out of focus ones uh, HoverNet fails to segment all of the cells. So moving into methodology, supervised learning provides a set of input output pairs such that a model can learn an intermediate system that maps inputs to correct outputs. Here I'm showing a simple example using some histology patches taken from the whole slide images that are mapped to labels that trained our model to determine in focus, clear, from out of focus, blur. So this training process involves presenting the model with a set of input features and their corresponding output labels and updating the model parameters to minimize the difference between the predicted output and the true output. And this is done using a loss function that measured the difference between the predicted output and the true output. Uh, so once the model was actually trained, it was able to do predictions on new unseen data where the model takes input features to predict corresponding output labels based on these learned functions. Uh, now, convolutional neural network, or CNN, is commonly used in computer vision applications. CNNs are inspired by the structure and function of the visual cortex in the human brain, which consists of layers of cells that process visual information. A CNN is typically composed of several layers of interconnected neurons, each of which performs an operation on the input data, which in this case consists of patches that are cropped from the whole site images. And then the key feature of the CNN is the convolutional layer, which applies a set of learnable filters to the input data to extract features at different spatial scales. And the filters can detect patterns such as edges, corners, and textures in these input images. And in our case, it was used for determining uh, the different out of focus textures and relevant patterns that pointed to a general lack of focus. Now the output of the convolutional layer is a set of feature maps that then represents this presence and the location of all these patterns. 
using backpropagation to adjust the weights of the filters and neurons, the network will minimize the difference between predicted and true outcomes. And that's how learning occurs. So in my case, we used a ResNet-18 as the CNN architecture, and this stands for a residual network with 18 layers, 16 of which are convolutional layers and two of which are fully connected. The convolutional layers are organized into four blocks, each containing multiple convolutional layers, followed by a shortcut connection that skips one or more layers. These shortcut connections allow the network to learn residual functions that are easier to optimize, enabling deeper networks with improved accuracy. ResNet 18 has been shown to achieve state-of-the-art performance on a range of computer vision tasks, including image classification, object detection, and semantic segmentation. The architecture has also become a popular baseline model for many computer vision applications. It's also very commonly used in transfer learning, where a pre-trained ResNet 18 model is fine-tuned on smaller data sets for specific tasks, such as medical image analysis or pathology diagnosis. So to expand more on transfer learning, it's a technique where a pre-trained model is used as a starting point for a new task instead of training a new model from scratch. So these models are typically trained on large data sets for a general task, such as image classification. Then instead of training new models completely from scratch, you can fine tune these pre-trained models on smaller data sets for new tasks. So fine tuning involves modifying the weights of the pre-trained models base layers to adapt better to the new data sets. And the model can learn from fewer examples and achieve better performance in less time. So our model was pre-trained with self-supervised learning on an abundance of histology patches. In total, the training data set contained over 170,000 patches with a breakdown of over 40,000 40, synthetically blurred patches, over 50,000 real out-of-focus patches, and the rest were clear patches. The patches were derived from 52 different tissue areas in the human body, and currently all the patches were stained using a mixed set of different stains and taken with a variety of scanners. Variety was being essential here. Uh, the training set contained patches from both public and private whole site image data sets with magnification between 20 and 40 times. So you might be asking why we're faking our data with synthetic blur, and there's two main, main reasons for that. So creating synthetic blur makes it easier to control the data set, and it allowed us to supplement existing data sets with real occurrences of out-of-focus to create a more balanced data set overall. As for how we went about choosing the types of artificial blurring, Gaussian blur applies a convolutional kernel with a Gaussian distribution to the image, which has the effect of smoothing everything. And Gaussian blur is commonly used in many image processing applications, including digital pathology, to reduce noise. Whereas bokeh blur mimics the aesthetic effect of a shallow depth of field in photography. So bokeh blur actually resembles real autofocus more. Now, most existing out-of-focus detection models use Gaussian blur in creating synthetic data sets, uh, but we chose to use a combination just to make it more realistic. Now, after the model was created, the utilization process needs to be as easy as possible for pathologists without a computational background to use. So therefore, we created a graphical user interface system, which allows the pathologist to batch select newly created whole site images. From here, the pathologist would wait while patch extraction occurred and the model was applied to predict the probability of out of focus and generate a heat map. To better show you the pipeline, here are some example images taken from a single heat map overlay. Now, based on the prediction outputs of the probabilities from patches taken from the whole slide image, a heat map of the whole slide image is generated. The probability heat map is a visualization plot that consists of a color of spectrums, a spectrum of colors <laughs> that corresponds to a range of probability values from zero to one. In this case, red is out of focus and blue is in focus. The advantage of outputting a heat map for out of focus region detection is that a pathologist can quickly locate the blurry regions and quickly determine which slides need rescanning. So moving on to the results, our model was verified using a human labeled data set from another out of focus detection model. Since the patch sizes from this model, the focus path data set were much larger than our own, we tiled them to a smaller size, which increased the original 8,640 patches to under 140,000. 
The FocusPass data set is comprised of real autofocus patches from nine differently stained whole site images at 40 times magnification. And all of these were manually labeled by pathologists. To calculate the accuracy of the model, a few different equations are chosen. They're placed on the left for your curiosity. But essentially, precision recall, balanced depth measure, true negative rate, and predict positive condition rate are all statistical measures used to evaluate the performance of a binary classification model. And these measures are used to assess the accuracy of the model's predictions. And essentially, results are showing that this model is performing very, very accurately when predicting the focus quality of this new unseen data set. To further test for generalizability, we extracted patches from a whole site image uh, with a stain and resolution the model has never seen before. Four whole site images stained with Mason's trichome at 10 times resolution were used for, from a publicly available data set. 63 patches of 256 by 256 pixels were extracted from them. And these 63 patches were then manually checked to ensure that there were no existing out of focus regions. They were then synthetically blurred to create a matching set of 63 patches. The model ran these 126 patches and the predicted accuracy was almost 93% with precision of one and recall of 0.75. Balanced F measure was 0.85. So this model does underpredict out of focus, uh, especially on unseen resolutions. Uh, and in order to up this a bit, it would need additional fine tuning on 10 times resolution. Now to compare the same whole site image output using two different models, uh, ours is on the left. Uh, both were tested using their respective GUI systems. And it took less than a minute to create a heat map and assess the focus quality of over 9,000 500 patches using our model. And contrarily, it took over three minutes for assessing six patches using another model on the same computer. Uh, this other model also crashed our slide viewer software when I tried to test on the maximum number of patches. But honestly, I think this is due to its different uh, architecture and MATLAB coding. So I previously mentioned that the, the goal of this was to create a user-friendly model that a pathologist could easily use without any coding experience. As such, a GUI was created to allow our pathology fellow to quickly batch process all of her scanned whole site images. So let's take a walkthrough of some screenshots that were taken using our platform. So here's the opening screen where you can select automatic processing of all new files in the staging folder, or you can provide a folder name and through a drop down menu, choose the exact file names of all the whole site images that you want to process. After submitting the job, you'll see a scan validation summary that shows every job session that has been submitted. And after the job has finished processing, you can click on the view results button. Here's an example from the results of the heat maps that you'll see from the processed whole site images. And you can also click to enlarge them. You can also see all the thumbnails of the original whole site images, as well as some additional information. These can all be enlarged and saved as well. So in order to wrap up, let's uh, see this model as solving, this model currently solves out of focus as a binary problem. However, you're probably thinking out of focus is not a binary problem, but classifying it is very difficult and subjective. To this end, for future work, a new model will be created with a regression model to allow for more gradual definitions of out of focus to be classified. The advantage of using synthetic blur filters was also that it would allow for this gradual increasing of the blur for better training in future models. This will enable more options for the GUI and pathologist use cases in the future. The current model is also in use by our pathology fellow, and she has reported significant time decreases in her overall rescanning process. So this model also helps the technologists who want to scan the slides well the first time and reduce problems from arising if they need to rescan again in the future, because having good focus quality images in our data sets fundamentally helps the people using machine learning to analyze these images. This model can be generalized to many other use cases, stains, resolutions, and tissues. And we've also noticed that it can detect tissue folds quite well, as you can see from this example, and pen markings, as they frequently also show up as out-of-focus regions. Future work will also consist of ablation studies to determine the minimal number of patches needed in any fine tuning on never-before-seen stains, resolutions, and features. To conclude, 
this out of focus detection model was necessary for us to improve the focus quality in our own data set creation. The model is useful in general for quality control for data acquisition and other tasks, and it is going to be released soon for free research use. The model is currently in use by our pathology fellow at Sunnybrook and works as a very reliable tool for reducing time spent manually annotating focus quality and slides. Thank you all for listening, and I will now open the floor for questions and discussions. Thanks so much, Phoenix. Great work. Really exciting to see this, and it's super cool that it's currently in use by the pathologists at Sunnybrook. So maybe I'll start by asking our adjudicators, Dr. Verma and Conrad, if you both have any questions to get us started. And then we'll turn it over to the audience. Feel free also to just type your questions into the chat. And I'll be, sorry, that was the timer. Um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat and I can answer them or call upon you there. Sure, maybe, maybe I'll go first. Um, uh, congratulations on the great work, uh, Phoenix, really exciting project. Um, I have many questions. I will start with uh, maybe one that's related to the clinical application. Um, I don't know if it's possible to quantify in some way um, how many out of focus images tend to be detected by your system, or I guess patches tend to be detected by your system. And um, can you provide us with any insight on how your system uh, leads to the time savings that you kind of alluded to? Um, does it mean that the, the pathologist is having to rescan fewer images or sort of maybe you can walk us through sort of the, the clinical application. And um, I guess, you know, where I was leading with that question, actually, you kind of uh, addressed thoughtfully in your sort of future directions point, which is I'm wondering if some kinds of out of focus are more or less clinically impactful than other kinds of out of focus and whether sort of how, how the plan is to think about that. Thank you for the great question. So, uh, actually like varying levels of out of focus are acceptable for most clinical applications, especially if you find these out of focus regions in non-clinically diagnosis important areas. Um, however, when you use this in machine learning, you don't really want any out of focus because you do really want high quality data sets. Um, now, in terms of actually using this whole process as pipeline for our pathology fellow, so uh, the technologist would scan these slides for us and then she would have to go through them. So let's just give an example of, we might have 200 slides scanned in one day. And prior to us implementing the system and she would have to go through every single slide manually. Um, for this in particular, we were actually scanning specific slides to use in a different machine learning algorithm that we were setting up. So we needed to have really high quality slides from the get-go and no focus quality uh, problems were acceptable. So she was having to go through about 200 slides and it might have taken a couple of weeks. After we implemented this, uh, she would spend about a day on the 200 slides because she could just quickly look at the results from all the heat maps. She could then check, is this a very slight level of blur that we found acceptable? Uh, and if it wasn't, she could just automatically rescan it. Uh, so it was for us at least uh, in actual practice, a reduction of a significant amount of times in terms of days and weeks. Uh, does, does that answer everything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that was great. Sorry, I, for sure. I, uh, good, good answer. I, I, does Does Conrad have a question? Otherwise, I can ask a second. Um, I, I would like to say thank you for uh, this one, this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to think of uh, perhaps a question. Um, so, in your future directions, we're talking about implementing uh, different levels of uh, kind of blurring or kind of out of focus um, in your full set images. Um, I was wondering if you're, so you're thinking about testing it using a regression model potentially. I was wondering if uh, potentially there is a um, an option to uh, look at potentially thresholds because you mentioned that there might be, for example, some 
uh, minor blurring, which is acceptable. Um, and and um, so I guess not really a question, but maybe just a future uh, point, I guess. Um, it could be looking at the threshold and kind of continuing on with this binary type of classification, but um, look like kind of like putting your threshold when you're starting to look at different levels of out of focus. Yeah, well, I can speak to that a bit. We uh, have been looking at a lot of different options, especially just weekly supervised options. Um, there's certain uh, things where perhaps, I guess more intuitively for the pathologist, they kind of want a slider to go on into this so that they could choose uh, an approximate amount of blurring threshold that they do find acceptable. Uh, as for actually implementing this, there's many different methods. Uh, one that we're looking at more so is because uh, out-focus is such a subjective problem. There's different methods where we can have a group of people uh, do some coll data collection uh, for manually labeling these different patches that are all different levels of blur, and then using that as some uh, supplemental labels to add into our training as well down the line. Um, but it, it's definitely work in progress. <laughs> Great. And maybe um, I'll ask one more quick question. It was really nice to see the performance on completely unseen data that represents a different type of stain and a different tissue type. Um, I was also curious in your general results, if you looked at model performance stratified by different tissue types to see if maybe one type of tissue or one type of stain is easier to predict than others. And if there are any interesting findings on that front. For sure. So actually it does perform best on uh, breast tissue, lymph, um, and uh, gastro uh, tissue. And the main reason for that is that is the most abundant data that we had going into the training process itself. Uh, some of the tissues that we did have were, um, well, we had tissue samples from almost everywhere in the body, but sometimes it might've only have been less than 10 patches of, of like tongue tissue, for instance. Uh, but it was exciting to see that it does perform quite well on especially 20 to 40 times magnification using most different stains. And I think the reason why it performed so well on unseen stains is because a lot of the augmentations that went into the training process uh, involved heavy color changes as well as grayscale and black and white. Makes a lot of sense. Well, that's really nice to hear. Thanks again, Phoenix, for that wonderful presentation. We'll now switch over to Sebastian. And so while Sebastian's getting his slides up, I'll read his bio. Sebastian is a PhD candidate in the Biological and Biomedical Engineering Department of McGill University. Before that, he attended INSA Toulouse, a five-year engineering school in the south of France, where he specialized in math and data science. He's passionate about AI and deep learning and is thrilled to apply them to medical imaging. Is working on several automating several tasks in the brachytherapy workflow. So we look forward to hearing about your work, Sebastian. And again, you've got 20 minutes, and then we'll take questions after that. We might just go a little bit over. So if people have to drop off, that's okay. Go ahead, Sebastian. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm very happy to be here today to present you part of my PhD project, which is on AI-based dose prediction in brachytherapy. So first, I'm going to talk to you a bit about brachytherapy. What is it and, uh, and the background of, of my project? Uh, I will introduce the solution that we propose uh, and then the results that we have and future works. So what is brachytherapy? So brachytherapy is a form of radiotherapy in which we irradiate directly from inside the patient body. So as uh, opposite to external beam radiotherapy, where you have external beams uh, traversing the, the patient body to, to reach the tumor. Here we are directly inside the patient body and closer to the tumor. So there's two ways to do brachytherapy. Either you insert needles inside patient tissues, 
or you insert applicators inside body cavities. So here the image uh, shows needles and the different yellow lights that you can see here along the needles are different dwell positions. So these dwell positions are the positions where the radioactive source can stay a certain time, known as the dwell time, to irradiate the tumor. And as compared with external beam radiotherapy, brachytherapy offers a better local control of the irradiation uh, next to the tumor and allows for a better sparing of the organs at risks uh, that are like surrounding the tumor. So now about the workflow. So first we insert the needle or applicator inside the patient body. Then we take a 3D imaging of uh, the treatment site. It can be either CT or MRI scan. Then from this uh, medical imaging, the radiation oncologist is contouring both uh, the tumor and uh, the organs at risks. And then there is a step of catheter reconstruction to let the treatment planning system knows where it can place the dwell position along the needles. Once it has this information, it can compute a dose map for each one of these dwell positions. Then uh, summing each contribution of the dwell position, we can obtain a total dose, which we can uh, summarize in 2D graphs and even 1D uh, indices. Uh, to uh, assess of the quality of the treatment. And then if the treatment is not acceptable by the doctor, then the doctor will just re-optimize uh, the different dwell times in order to have a better distribution on, of the dose on the tumor or on the organs at risks. So that's the workflow of uh, brachytherapy. Now, there are some limitations uh, on this workflow. The first of them is about organ segmentation. This is manual and time consuming, as well as the catheter reconstruction step. But today we're gonna focus on this third limitation, which is uh, on those calculation. And the main reason why this is a limitation, this is not about time gain here. This is more about an accuracy gain because the dose that are used right now in the clinic are those in water. So they do not consider uh, all the heterogeneities of the patient uh, tissues. So now I'm gonna present the different types of dose because I'm, I'm talking about two different types of dose. So, um, a lot of years ago, the AAPM, the Association of American Physicists in Medicine, presenting, presented during their task group 43 a formalism to compute those received in a water uh, phantom. And uh, what's really nice with this formalism is that we can compute those received in each voxel with a very simple formula. So the, the only hypothesis that we need to um, use this formula is that the patient is water. And then we just plug and play. So it's just about the dimension of the source, it, its radioactive activity. And then we just can come up with a, a voxel value of those for any voxel inside the patient one. So that's analytical. That's what's used in the clinic because it's fast. But uh, more recently, the AAPM came up with uh, the gold standard method, they presented the gold standard method for those calculations, which are Monte Carlo simulations. And these are completely different um, process. So Monte Carlo simulation works by simulating the actual physics uh, that's happening when you irradiate a patient body. So you do this by using uh, softwares that simulate the evolution of particle into matter. And so what we simulate in brachytherapy is radioactive decay. And uh, they, you have like probabilities of interaction with different tissues. So you have to sample a lot of decays to have a good average of the dose deposited inside the voxels representing the patient body. And the problem with this method is that if you want a good uncertainty on the dose deposited, then you need a large number of decay events. So on one side, you have the gold standard method uh, but which is time consuming, but more accurate. And on the other side, you have the older method, which is those in water, uh, which is quickly computed and which is used in the clinic. So the idea of my project is to bring this gold standard method uh, in the clinic to gain accuracy on the dose predicted. So the hypothesis, 
the, the thing that we try to do is to use what we already have, which is the dose in water, because as I said, this is quickly computed. And we also have the patient geometry that we derive from the CT scans. And then we want to predict with an AI tool uh, something close to the gold standard method, which is the dose, what we call the dose in medium. But medium here just means that uh, we uh, allocated uh, different tissues for each voxel in the patient body. So from, uh, let's say, a row initial dose and the patient geometry, we want to predict a more accurate dose. So I'm just going to remind a bit about the workflow, because that's going to be useful after, because I'm going to be talking about the symmetric indices. So the way it works is that we have CT scans. We have a lot of slices. And then we have the source information is geometry. And we also have one dwell position at a time. These are the inputs that we feed to the Monte Carlo simulations to obtain a dose map. Then we do this for every single dwell position in our plan. And we also have the contours of the different organs. This is an organ at risk, the lung, in the case of breast cancer patients. Um, we sum the contribution of each dwell position dose maps, and then we can assess how much dose is received by each organ at risk. And so all of these are volumes. You can um, sort of uh, plot them in, in, inside a 2D graph here inside the dose volume histogram. And then you can sum them up even further uh, into a 1D dimension, which is a dosimetric index. So you have the DXCC used for the organ at risk, which is the maximum dose received in X centimeter cube of the volume. And here you have the DX, which is the uh, minimum dose received by X percent of the volume. So usually we use the D90. We want to know that at least the, the tumor receive at least uh, in 90 percent of its volume a certain number of uh, dose. And then we want to uh, check for the maximum that is received by the organ at risk. So that's the workflow of uh, the dose symmetry. And, and these indices are uh, monitored by the doctor when, when um, creating the plan. But the idea is we want to replace these Monte Carlo simulations with a deep learning model that could save some uh, time in the creation of very accurate dose. So instead of spending hours simulating on um, very high uh, efficiency computers, we would just predict in a matter of seconds with an already trained uh, model. So now let's move on to what we already did uh, in the study. So the data that we used, so we worked with breast cancer patients that have been treated with high dose rate brachytherapy. Uh, we divided them in training and validation test sets. And for training and validation, we sampled an equal number of dual positions per patient because all of the patients are different. They don't have the same number of needles inserted, so not the same number of dual positions. And for the test set, we needed to predict on all dwell positions because we reconstruct the, the total plan uh, at the end to assess the dose received. So the way it works is that we simulated the gold standard uh, dose distribution with our software, uh, which is called Rapid Bracky MCTPS for Monte Carlo treatment planning system it is based on GN4 software. So GN4 is a software made by the CERN. Uh, which is a software that simulates the evolution of particle inside matter. And then we also computed the, the dose in water, so the, with the TG43 formalism, with this simple formula. All of this has been done for a specific source, which is Iridium-192. And uh, then, so this is the data creation step. And then we purposes the data. So the biggest part of it was the cropping. I'm going to come back to this notion later. And then we train the model, and then we could assess different plans with deep learning and with um, TG43 formalism to compare them. So as I said, uh, we want to use the dose in water computed with TG43 and the patient geometry that we derived from the Hansfield unit uh, from the CT scans. And we want to predict uh, gold standard dose in heterogeneous medium, which is the patient body. So the most difficult part was to actually be able to train something because our CT scans are very uh, big volumes and the resolution that we want in the clinic is one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter. 
So we cannot really resize these volumes. So we have to crop them. And uh, we cannot simply crop them here in, in our case with breast cancer patient because all the patients are different. Sometimes you have left uh, breast cancer, sometimes you have right breast cancer, all of the bodies are different. So it can be higher up or not. So the idea is to come up with a cropping strategy that uh, fits every patient. So the main idea for the cropping strategy that we developed is we want the cropped volume to contain the same information for the treatment planning than the base volume. And in order to do this, we only want to keep the part of the organic risk used in the dosimetry indices because these dosimetry indices are the indices looked at by the doctor during the treatment planning. So the idea is that we have an importance metric, which is here the distance to the dwell position is just the sum of the, all of the distance to every dwell position. We have the masks for all of the organ set risks, and then we only keep uh, the part that are the closest to the dwell positions. And our hypothesis is, here is that uh, the closer uh, the voxels are to the dwell position, the more those they receive. So we basically, uh, say that uh, the closer uh, the 10 cc here, so the closer 10 centimeter cube voxels from the lung are the, the voxels that receive the most dose. Uh, so we do this step for every organ at risk, and then from this very big volume, we can only keep this volume, and we would have the same information for the treatment planning. So we can choose to keep a certain number of centimeter cube per organ at risk, and it will increase the size of our volumes. So in the clinic, they use the D2CCs as uh, dosimetric indices. So we, we kept D10CC to have a margin of error in, in our case. So now that the volumes are pre-processed and that they uh, make it possible to train something because they are small enough, we can try to train something. But once again, we still have big volume. So we cannot go with very deep architecture with a lot of parameters. So the first model we tried was the famous unit. And uh, the way we would pass the, these two inputs to a unit, the standard way is to concatenate these two inputs and then feed them to the unit. Uh, one issue we saw with that was if you do that, then the filters from the first convolutional layer uh, are gonna be the same for the two inputs. And then you're gonna sum the output of these filters together. So basically you're gonna lose uh, the, the specificity of the two inputs uh, very fast during your training procedure. If you have a lot of filters here, you can compensate uh, for this, but still. So we came up with another architecture, which learned features, especially for the specific inputs separately. And then uh, we fuse the two information together by element-wise multiplication. So this is our proposed model, and which is called here CUNET for a combining uh, unit. And we also try different normalization strategy because we have a small batch sizes. So we just wanted to try what worked best. Um, and the volume sizes have been defined by our cropping strategy. And during the training, we minimize the sum of the squared error between our prediction and the Monte Carlo uh, dose maps. So we trained a, a bunch of models and then we selected the best uh, that reached the best performance uh, on the training and validation sets. And we gathered results from these uh, best models. So here we can see that the small units, so uh, I don't know if you noticed earlier, but, but it doesn't have the same number of channels as uh, the, the famous unit, and it does not also have the same number of downsampling loads. Uh, so that's why we call it the small one. So the small unit here has more parameters than our combining unit, because for our combining unit, we uh, even reduce uh, more the number of channels, but you will see that it performs uh, better. So here we, we compare the mean absolute person error between all of these methods to predict those maps and the Monte Carlo uh, gold standard gold, those maps. So first thing you can observe is that the TG43 formalism uh, has very large error compared to the gold standard method, 
but that that's uh, for voxels far from the uh, dual position mostly, but still. And then all of the deep learning strategies that you can see here, they all have much lower error. And our uh, proposed model has the lowest one with around 1% mean absolute percent error on all of the individuals, um, uh, those maps on our testing set. And, and the prediction is really fast. It's less than 0.1 second for one dual position, those maps. So prediction on, on, on a whole patient depends on the number of dual position uh, in, 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 the, in the treatment plan. And now we can also have a look at the different volumes of interest. So if we look at the CTV here, again, our model uh, has very low error, uh, and same goes for every of the organ that risks. And now uh, we can build back the total dose received for our test patients and compare the dosimetric indices that we obtain. And then we can uh, compare them with the Monte Carlo plan. And the, so comparison between Monte Carlo plan and deep learning plan. And here we can see that there is really almost no difference uh, in dosimetric indices uh, between our plan, the plan that we create with deep learning, and the Monte Carlo one. So it's always lower than 0.2% here for our method, whereas for TG43, we have uh, around 5% error for the CTV, uh, which is the clinical target volume. And then the error is bigger for skin and lung. Here you can see it's almost 10% for the lung. Uh, it can be explained by the air, uh, which has a very different scattering condition uh, for radioactive source than uh, water. And if you remember, t t the TG43, those maps are uh, computed in water. And now we can compare with previous works that have been published. So rapid EDL was a model published in, uh, by a former student in our lab. And he worked on prostate on the three by three by three millimeter grid a phantom, and he obtained a difference of around 1% for all of the uh, organs at risk and two more here. Uh, this is another study by another group uh, working on cervix on a low resolution as well of three by three millimeter cube voxels. And um, here the error is also between one and 2% for all of the uh, dosimetric indices. And this is our work. So we work with breast with a much higher resolution. So our voxels are 27 times smaller, uh, but still we, we reached a very high performance of um, to symmetric indices that are below 0.2%. So this is for our results. So to conclude, we can say that we came up with a deep learning model that can predict those, uh, that can predict gold standard like those accurately. And we also came up with a new cropping strategy that allows for this high resolution uh, training. Future works will involve, uh, try to generalize the model to different treatment sites. So I've talked about prostate, cervix, breast, all of these sites are sites for which brachytherapy is uh, well used. So we could think about um, generalizing our method to these treatment sites, but we, would, we could also think about generalizing the model to different radioactive sources. Um, because here we work with iridium-192, which is a high energy source, but we, can, we could also think about uh, working with different sources. And also we would like to integrate this to our uh, homemade treatment planning system. And next step would be to work on the deep learning model to have a measure of the uncertainty uh, as long as the prediction. So to um, let the doctors know, okay, we are really certain about this prediction, so you can really use it uh, for your uh, treatment plan. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And now uh, we'll take any question if you have some. Thanks very much, Sebastian, for that very interesting presentation. Again, I'll turn it over to our adjudicators to see if they'd like to start us off in terms of questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can I can take the first stab. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. It was a, a really uh, great talk and very interesting research. Um, I'm curious if you could flip back to the uh, slide where you were comparing to other models. 
<clears throat> um, so flip ahead, I think uh, you complain, compared your uh, uh, performance to the other models on breast and prost there was a prostate one. Oh, and, um, oh I see. One. Yes. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, this yes. one compares to the other study. Um, perfect. Um, in the other studies, I'm curious, what did they use as the gold standard for the uh, 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 dosimetric indices? Is it the same as what you used in your study? And can you comment on the comparability of these uh, results? So that, that's an excellent question. So actually, the gold standard is always uh, Monte Carlo because the AAPN task group report 186 has been published like a, a something like 10 or 20 years ago. So there has been some research and all of these research uh, are based, the ground truths are Monte Carlo simulations. However, uh, the inputs that are used are, are really different. So, so for th this model, for example, there was no use of... Uh, let's say a good initial dose as inputs whereas in my work i already use like a good initial dose which is like the dose in water but from this group this work they predict everything from scratch and uh, from this work they also uh, use uh, an initial dose but that's not the dose in water that's more of a um I mean, i don't remember exactly but but, but they do have an initial guess as well but all of them try to predict gold standard Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much. And maybe I'll just ask one follow up to that, which is um, <clears throat> I don't I don't know uh, clinically if if this has any influence or not, because ultimately your really model performance relates primarily to the ability to calculate um, a dose compared to the gold standard, right? Um, but um, the anatomy of uh, uh, prostate and cervix are quite different than the anatomy of breast, particularly in terms of the proximity to the other tissues which are vulnerable, right? So, you know, with a uh, prostate, it's much prox more proximate and closer to the rectum, the urethra, the bladder. So you have a lot more like a crowding of organs in that space. And I suppose the same could, is true in the cervical region, whereas um, uh, there's a little bit more, I guess, uh, uh, forgiveness in the in the breast because you have a little bit more geographic separation from the chest wall or from the lungs, and so I'm curious if that influences the the results at all. Well, uh, this has not been used uh, in the clinic right now, unfortunately, because we need to integrate it to our treatment planning system. So, so I cannot really comment on that. But what what I can comment on is that uh, if like there is a big difference between cervix, prostate, and breast. And uh, the difference for breast is much bigger than for other sides. So here you can see a difference with the dose in water, which goes up to 10% for different organs at risk. It will not be as big for prostate or cervix because uh, the tissue that you find uh, on a prostate side are closer, their scattering condition are closer to water because like you have the bladder and stuff like this, which is uh, closer to water, but lung and air, which is right next to the breast, right next to the radioactive sources, air has very different scattering condition compared to water. So, so like this study has shown that, uh, and is in agreement with other study that, that that says that breast, uh, uh, like the difference in those received is more important between Monte Carlo and those in water for breast and for other treatment sites. So I do think there is a clinical relevance uh, for, uh, for, for this work, but it's just about if we are able to uh, integrate it in the clinic and uh, then we can actually assess uh, the relevance of uh, these two. Great, thank you so much. Not seeing any hands raised or questions in the chat, I'm happy to ask another question. So thank you for going through this in so much detail. My question is um, regarding explainability. And I know that's often a contentious topic in AI, but since you're switching from a very physics-based approach um, to machine learning-based approach, do you find that your end users feel differently about translating a machine learning model into practice compared to the, the physics-based model. In other fields like meteorology, we've seen that sometimes moving away from the physics-based 
approaches to things like climate forecasting or weather forecasting actually perform better, but maybe the trade-off is that we don't necessarily understand in the same way what's actually going on to generate that better performance. So I was wondering if you could comment on, on that phenomenon here, if it is applicable. Well, I think it is applicable and it would be a very interesting uh, area of research. Uh, that's not one that I chose for my PhD because I, I, I see it this way. Either you try to explain the like the decision of your model and it, then you can provide that to your uh, doctor or clinician which is using the model, or you can try to uh, give a measure of the uncertainty. And, and that's uh, the idea that was the most favorable among the, my PhD committee members. So, so that's what I'm going to explore. So the idea is that if the model trains on a data set and then it has very uh, low uncertainty, then when you try on other data set, it, it should be able to say, okay, now I have a high uncertainty, so don't believe me. But I agree with you, maybe it would be better to have some sort of uh, explainability measure, but, but I, I'm not sure uh, how it would work in my case because for segmentation, it can be clear, like you can print heat maps on the input uh, image to see, okay, what uh, voxels made me take this decision and made me make this segmentation. But for my case, um, uh, I, as my problem is regression, I think this is a whole uh, area of research, and, uh, but, but I, I did not plan to explore that further during my PhD, but, but that would be very interesting to explore. Totally fair. Okay, seeing no more questions in the chat or hands raised, I think we can wrap for today. So thank you again to our presenters, Phoenix and Sebastian for sharing their amazing work. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our next event and please stay tuned on our TKRM Twitter or the events page on our website for our next event. Thank you again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now. Bye.